Mm. All right, so we're starting uh, lecture six, and we will discuss two articles today. And the first one is the player typology in theory and practice. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the paper typology in theory and practice. And next slide. They want to talk first, first about the uh, button types. And it's um, mostly based on multi massive multiplayer online games, the button types. And there you have four different types of player in this button types. It's one is the achiever, the explorer, the socializer, and the killer. And this special test for those types was constructed for mostly entertainment. And it was never intended to be so robust against other stuff. So it was not really uh, yeah. um, Then the next, we have the Yeast Motivation. I hope I was pronouncing it right. It's also based for massive multimedia online games, MMOs. And there, the Archiva and the Killer are overlapping in this motivation. But it has some additional motivations. It's the uh, customization and the escape. And it's based more on um, more experienced uh, experience players. So yeah, it's more for the advanced players than for the casual players, for the hardcore gamers. Instead of. But these both motivations were just for this uh, MMO topic. Mm. Then we have uh, Myers Briggs. It's a psychometric model. Uh, it's not really a true fair apology. It's more investigation um, about how these patterns which we have discussed before, uh, and other stuff is working through these games. Um, then the five-factor model and player certifi certification. certification. Um, this is also, again, more relevant to the online games. But it's just uh, explained maybe 2.6 to 7 percent of the whole game preservation. So there's a lot of more stuff which you have to take care about when you want to rate a game or it should be. And so it's just one variable under a lot of other ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the demo Selfie, democracy game design model, short uh, DPD. Um, it was first um, gathered uh, via surveys and the case studies between 2002 and 2004. And it included four different types of play games it's conqueror, manager, wanderer, and participant. And, um, it's also, uh, next slide. Um, it also um, makes the difference, between, it also says, talks about the difference between players. So that you have the hardcore players on the one side and the causal players on the other side, in one case. And also, it differs a little bit uh, the hardcore players. So, um, there are two different types of hardcore players in this case. Um, there are difference between uh, the one hardcore player who just wants to win, and actually another one who just like to play games because they are for them nice to play. And this other one should maybe not play hardcore gamers, they should be called something like gamer hobbies. Because they enjoy this game by itself more than just to pull other people there. So actually the game, an excited. So actually the gamer hobbyist is a player who plays lots of different kind of games. He's not fixed in just one chain of games, I would say, and just is open. And he plays regularly also 
different kind. So, and he has also high understanding for digital games. So he knows lots of different types of games. And how to play them. Mm -hmm. Next one. Then this uh, DGD was, uh, after some time, they make the next step with it. It's 1.5 now. And so why they did it, it was to make it less uh, uh, dependent on the Myers bridge. And it's now have some more distinction in it. And it also discussed um, what hardcore players want more and what causal players want more. So for example, the hardcore players are looking for challenges in this game. And the casual player, mostly when they just lose, they lose the interest in this game. So it's hard to keep both, actually, one game interested, because it's can be one too easy or too hard. Mostly. So it's, it needs to be in the middle of it. Um, then the next step of this DGD was the DG2. Um, this time, they collected the data for this uh, whole uh, report. Um, also, more uh, more collected this data in the gaming community. Because earlier, it was just on some random website place advertising for this um, survey. So there was not so many gamers in this survey before. And now they had 1,040 participants. And they needed 10 to 5, uh, 5 to 10 minutes for one survey. And, but the, another point was that it has really a strong safety to it. Because the people had to um, say by themselves, I am a hardcore gamer, I am a casual gamer. So it was kind of hard to say there which was really the truth, because later we'll come to it more. Because you have some people who say they can play really good, but they are casual players. And if you say you, you're the best in one game, if you just say you're a casual player, something mostly doesn't fit, because it's not possible, it's easy. And, but because of the self uh, influence, it's not really useful for uh, to use it on other researchers because it can, yeah, it's always misdirection from the safe and from the people. Next slide. The, um, the measure and the criticism, more about this. And the question in the survey were actually mostly about how often the player were, play were playing, so once per week, once per day, once per month. Um, what kind of emotion do they feel in this game? Is this anger? Is it happiness? What they want to feel there? And also they ask uh, how good they can play this. Uh, the most people who participated in this research were from North America people, North American people. So maybe it could be also different in Asian countries. Um, yeah, there's again this with this um, self identified hardcore player. And casual players, which are playing actually every day, but they also were casual players. That's also a question if it's really like this. Mm. Next slide. Um, then we have the results about the emotions. It was not really like the people who made this um, survey expected, because they expected that people want to be feel, feel excitement, and they want to make cruelty. But actually, the people wanted to get amused, to have some stuff to do, and to get surprised. So they kind of different stuff. They wanted more than this is what they were expecting. And also, um, the people like to tell other people how to play. That makes them the game more, more interesting. It means snatches. It's, um, it's a positive uh, emotion identified by Eggman that of course when a parent or teacher enjoys the success of the child student in a context they have prepared for them for. Um, yeah. It also so it talks about the frustration because some people like to get this frustration and to get angry at these games. And some other people will just say, I don't want it. And if they get frustrated they just stop playing this game because it doesn't make sense for them anymore. Um, this is the results about the skill and the social, so, social interaction with the people. Um, yeah. 
So lots of people <laughs> give themselves a high mark of the skill in the games, which is actually, yeah, not really. It's also the self uh, report about themselves that they think they are good in this game, but they don't know. And from this, they're just 50% separate <coughs> from that for. And also the social is um, that the most popular is actually the single player. Because the multiplayer games are separated in different um, things. You have the MMOs, you have the local area network games, and you have the games where you play on the internet but with clans. I mean, like you play, for example, Counter Strike. So it's more divided. But actually, the question is um, what is the MMO, in my opinion, in this case, also? In this? Because if you have. Um, if you look at nowadays, you have, for example, Candy Crush and Farmville, which actually also MMO, because you can interact there with other people. So it's kind of strange that it's just 16.4% in the story, which I was in. So we get to the conclusion of this paper. Um, this whole process and putting this whole games in pattern and to make research about it is um, necessary to find the reason why um, uh, how player would fit in this topology so you can develop games for special kind of players. And also that the division into hardcore and causal player should not longer be also so strict because you have to make actually games for both kind of players. Because most of the people are playing daily, and it's kind of hard to say who's hard one to schedule, so you have to make it uh, more casual for them to play or not. And, yeah. Next slide. Um, so the third theory of this whole is actually. Um, to open the organization, to, to have this uh, anger games also, that to save people, and also games that make avoidance of frustration for other people, because it's really something which you cannot combine in one game. Um, yeah, and degree for tolerance for real time play, preference for group versus solo play, you should take care about all those different points. Thank you. Questions? Okay, my, I, have a, I have a question. Um, what did you think of um, the reliance on self-reporting as um, a, a research approach? Uh, do you believe people's self-reported um, opinion on things, or do you think that might be a systematically bias, a systematic bias in research? Mm. I think you have more to make it uh, more say that they can say they have access. Maybe it's better to make in such surveys uh, uh, little tests included so that they will see by themselves over this test how good are they in the special game field. So that this test actually is at the end saying it, and not the people by themselves and say, ah, I'm good, I'm good at it, I'm good at it. Because they not know sometimes, because we saw that lots of players are playing solo, so they don't know really how good other people are in this game. So they cannot make by themselves this uh, that test, how they good they are. So maybe it should be a little bit supported, like you have to make a test for that how to see how good you are, in my opinion. Also, um, when you're talking about how important things are to people, um, there's the issue of the difference between the people that they want to be and the people that they are. Right? So you get the whole how important the story to you. Oh, it's it's very important, right? Because you know. They, they kind of feel that story should be important to them, and so they say it's important to them, right? It's like if you ask somebody, um, do you respect your teachers? 
of course we respect our teachers. Because, <laughs> you know, you're supposed to respect your teachers, and so you say that you do, even if secretly you don't, because you kind of have an, a, a knowledge of what's expected of you. Um, and so the, the question is to how much people are responding according to what they would like people to think that they are, rather than how they actually are. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the, 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 the significant challenges with doing survey-based research, is that you find out more about what people think they are like, rather than what they are actually like. So, I, do you think this is a consistent um, bias in the research in that way? Do you think do you think that's part of the, the problems that they came across? Mm -hmm. Is it not matching? What again? So yeah. So how do the surveys match up with the actual real uh, state of the world? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good question because uh, actually I think we have to make surveys like really with professionals together so that you see the real state of some and then you can compare actually how the surveys will be with the real compare because mostly you don't have the real comparing to the world there because it's just online surveys where people put in. So in this case there we don't have this real surveys to compare with but I think the real world will be also different from this because there are some kind of cases where it's already visible that it's not the real, it cannot be the real point of war because you cannot just have uh, people which are good in the game. Yeah, so it's kind of, maybe it would be good to have something in this case, first to have uh, maybe 10 people which you can really uh, take this test with, with a professional which can really detect what is really going on. And then to compare mm -hmm. this whole with the other ones, so we can see where where the most um, gaps between the real world and this. Because I think it's on some um, statements there, which must cause game skill or also what kind of players they are. Because I think this uh, casual and this hardcore is hard to define if you are not like that. Because most of think, come, I'm just casual player, playing every day, but it's yeah, I'm not because mostly hardcore. It's, uh, for some people, it's quite already addicted to the PC, so they think actually no, I'm not that. So I'm. Pleasure. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would say that my my stepmother, um, my, not stepmother, my mother-in-law. See, I've just got married. Um, my <laughs> mother-in-law. Um, she has uh, she had an operation in October and started playing um, uh, the match three games. Right? Um, because my sister-in-law showed her this because you know she was she was in um, she was in recovery so she couldn't lift anything and couldn't do work around the house so she was just stuck there with her iPad playing match three games so she was probably playing three four five hours of match three style games every day and she's kind of a casual player because you know she's just kind of doing it because she can't do anything else. But that kind of counts as hardcore when you're doing it every day for hours and hours and hours. So, yeah, and as you say, it's hard to make that distinction. But maybe um, and just your own feeling isn't a good measure. Mm. But maybe it also depends more on the situations by itself. Because if you have nothing to do else, of course you will probably play more one game than if not. So if you're, for example, in the hospital, where you're most of the time bored, because earlier people were watching their whole day long television, at least I can remember from my childhood also, mm -hmm. but nowadays they have their iPads and play their games, I mean, yeah. what else? But I still, I, yeah, I don't think you'd describe someone who was invalided in hospital um, and, and couldn't move but could play, play, play three years as a hardcore gamer necessarily, even if they are playing much longer than any hardcore gamer, perhaps. <laughs> um, so yeah, it is a very, very tricky distinction. It's one, certainly the game industry is still struggling with. Um, you'll find that this paper is written by academics um, and um, in a kind of very analytical, sort of navel-gazing kind of way rather than as pragmatic, um, we're just making games to make money kind of way. Um, so there's an interesting disconnect between the kind of sociology of games and the research done on games and game developers. 
um, and this is still falling in one of those sort of academic assessment of, of gaming without being kind of this is what you do to make your game better. Um, mm. but, uh, Simon, I think that we uh, talk about uh, surveys. I think that it's, uh, it's it's not like they are. It's always a bad idea to do a survey uh, because I mean some some motivational aspects you can better get proven by doing a survey, but. Just doing a survey, and especially when you ask people about them for performance, <laughs> it's, it's not a very good idea. You know, from uh, well, I mean, you know, from Norway, and uh, if you ask drivers whether they are better than average, average, or worse than average drivers, they more than fifty percent are better than average. So that's always the way it is. <laughs> you can definitely do better, yes. and you can learn a lot about the uh, uh, subjects. It really depends on what you are, what you want to find out. Yeah, absolutely. And what what is verifiable? So, for example, the amount of time people spend playing is an objective measure which you can measure. Mm -hmm. So you can self-report that, and you can kind of actually measure how much you play. And then you can categorize people as hardcore if they play, say, more than four hours a day, and casual if they play less. Mm -hmm. But some measures are kind of very subjective and they are not easily measured and then it becomes kind of tricky so I found this article a little bit difficult because some of the things they were talking about were easily identifiable and measurable and some were not and they mixed everything together in a single bag and treated everything the same and I thought that, that is probably not the right way to do it um, yeah but also with this time it would be already a problem because people think when they pay too much it would be no good so yeah, I'm not like for being three hours, but they already will say I play less, play less than it actually will. Mm. Yes, the classic of how much exercise do you do? Um, people always report more exercise than they <laughs> actually do. Because it's a good to report, <laughs> yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you ask men and women um, what percentage of the housework do you, you, you do, um, in most households you find that there's more than 100% of the housework being done. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> people massively over report. Um, but no, you're right. I mean, this is a, the classic issue of, of uh, and again, kind of the sociologists who don't, I mean, don't see the difference between things that they could find a way of measuring if they use the technology versus things that people just feel. Right? And sometimes it's very hard to get sociologists who are analysing these sort of things to think analytically as can be the scientists would do and say, okay, what is your data? Rather than how do how does how does the player experience it is more what data can you get, what metrics can you actually get? Mm. Um, and so yeah, this is a kind of asking questions rather than hardcore metrics kind of approach. And I think that's also probably some of the reasons why I'm having problem with the term hardcore, because hardcore doesn't uh, it's not just about how much time you spend. It's also about the motivation and why are you doing this. And you can't be that over just measuring how much you play. It's, it's more, it's deeper, it's more on the motivation and the intention. Yeah, and a lot of, a lot of the hardcore gamers, um, were, from, from reading about hardcore and casual for a while now, um, Hardcore gamers tend to be, say, you can only be a hardcore gamer if you play shooting games or sports games or racing games, right? <laughs> Those are the hardcore games, like military shooting games. If you're not playing one of them or an RTS, if you're not playing that group, right, you can't be a hardcore gamer on puzzle games. And you can't be a hardcore gamer on um, platformers, right? You can't be a hardcore platformer game. Yeah. Right, now that's not hardcore. Right, you've got to it's got to be shooting stuff or driving stuff really fast. Or um, so mm -hmm. it's almost a sort of cultural we're identifying ourselves as kind of true Scotsman kind of thing. Exactly. Like the whole new no true Scotsman argument. Right? Um, have you guys you guys know the no true Scotsman argument? Yeah. Who doesn't know the no? Well, some of our non uh, Anglo um, Anglo Saxons won't know it. But um, the the no true Scotsman argument is that no true Scotsman um, doesn't wear a kilt, right? And the problem is, you, so you go and find someone you say, oh, there's a true Scotsman, he's not wearing a kilt, and the answer is, well, he's not a true Scotsman, is he? <laughs> right? So it's a self-referential definition. 
right? So if you say hardcore gamers only play shooter games, and then you're going to say, hey, look at this person. They play exactly like you do. So they're exactly like you, except they're playing match three games. You say, well, they're not a hardcore gamer, right? Because a hardcore gamer wouldn't play that kind of game. Exactly. So it's kind of that self-referential kind of, of definition. Uh, and then unfortunately, that's how a lot of the, the hardcore, the definition of hardcore gamer ends up. Is it's just a hardcore gamer is what a hardcore gamer is, and there isn't anything <laughs> deeper than that. Exactly. I don't think there's any agreement on what a hardcore exactly. gamer it's actually a, is. It's a kind of an ambiguous term. So I, I quite like the other term, the, the um, hobbyist, because they yeah they kind of clearly identify the person who knows a lot of games and played a lot of different genres and knows kind of a lot about the industry and so on. So that was a little bit clearer of who the hobbyist might be, what that category is. But the distinction between the casual and uh, hardcore wasn't clear. What wasn't clear also was that they used some statistical measurements to classify and cluster things. And as, as Simon was just saying, some of those things were self-referential. So they set up categories, and then they say, oh, yeah, look, the people group in those categories, because we could ask them to group themselves into categories. Uh, and then statistically, they say, oh, yeah, those categories correlate, and those don't, and so on. And that wasn't clear as well, of how, how that was set up, and what actually was measured, and what was being inferred from the cluster. Yeah. But yeah, what well, the biggest problem I have is that if you think of the film industry and film genres and people watching the films and you try to classify the viewers and say, well, there is a category of comedy lovers, people who love comedies. How useful is that? I mean, if, you know, there are comedies you like and comedies you don't like. And how useful is to be classified as a comedy lover? for the film industry. It, I don't know. I don't think it's useful at all. It's so hard. For example, if you have this um, website that will uh, recommend you movies based on what you've already seen, it usually doesn't work. Yeah. But uh, you, you like comedies, and you get all these crappy recommendations. So I think it's kind of a multi-dimensional problem, which they try to flatten, and it will not work as a sort of a flat category type, you know, setup. Uh, so recommendations would work if they observe friends who are like you, who like certain films like you, and then they can recommend you what your friends like as well, right? But they don't know how it works. They don't know how, why your friends like that film. And it's similar here. There are comedies I like and comedies I hate. And I I mean, categorizing me as a comedy lover would be sort of pointless, because it wouldn't capture the essence of, of what I like and what I don't like. Mm -hmm. It's the same with strategy games. Some games I like and some I don't, even though they are all strategy games. So you know, it's a little bit tricky to, to, to kind of flatten that complex issue of, you know, of preferences and, and certain types of players and so on. Yeah. All right, uh, let's have a look at the question posted for that article. Um, yeah, so w what did you mean in the, what was your, mm. what wanted you to ask? I, I couldn't rephrase the question because I didn't get the, the point. Yeah, I just wanted to ask that, uh, how it can be clarified that the student is enjoying the game, uh, his anger, his significance of anger, I mean, uh, how to explain it. That, um, is the self-reporting is sufficient to uh, check the significance of the anger if I would basically want to ask um, But uh, the, the answer is that it, um, we can use the biometrics to check how the user play and you can check its anger. And, uh, I see. And, OK. Uh, <laughs> I didn't, I, so you wanted to ask how we can actually measure yeah. the, the anger while people are playing it? Yes. OK. Um, yeah. Um, OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I did just it. measure this. Does that clarify this measure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
can be measured, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, you, you used the word clarified, and I was confused by that word. So uh, I thought it might, you, that word might not fit in here. It might be a different word. So measured probably is the right yeah. uh, right word. So if, if we imagine, I can re rewrite it quickly. Uh, maybe not. It's too small. Just, yeah, just leave it. There. Yeah. So, yeah, so the final question was how significance of anger can be measured for certain players? Um, and yeah, I mean, self reporting yeah, may work to a certain degree. I mean, people can be aware of being angry, uh, and they, that may tolerate quite well. But you can also easily measure some external. Um, blood pressure. Or yeah, exactly. Blood pressure and uh, skin contactants, and yeah, maybe even use EEG or just observing yeah. people. You usually can tell if <laughs> someone gets angry. So yeah, one one I saw was they were using um, IR on the forehead to measure stress. So the blood flow through the forehead, and, and then when you're angry, you frown more, and so you kind of use a different set of muscles to when you're kind of happy or it's pride. So they were looking at the kind of heat generated from the face to work out what kind of muscle groups you were using and therefore categorize it as what kind of emotion you were feeling. Mm -hmm. so, mm. Yep. Um, so that was the question five. So let's go backwards. So question four, what is the difference between first and second demographic game design models? I think the first one was really much more uh, dependent on the Maya personality uh, mm -hmm. test, and the other one tried to be a little bit more independent of it. Yeah. Uh, so in, in the article, they haven't clearly identified why being reliant on uh, Myers Bricks is a bad thing, and why being independent is better, and why we should evolve towards that. Uh, it wasn't clear. Uh, yeah, also in, in the article, they did identify the original type based sort of c categories and the uh, traits based ones. Mm -hmm. And it also wasn't clear yeah. why one could be better than the other. Um, they, they just post some of the. I think they found some sort of correlation between these types and the results from the personality tests, and it wasn't really quite clear. Mm. Yeah, so the, yeah, that's the DGD models. Uh, question number three, how do female players rate themselves compared to male players, and why? Toko remembers? It was worse. Yeah. Or more accurate. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we don't know. So they always rated themselves lower than the male uh, counterparts. And why could that be? It's what we do. <laughs> of being more accurate or being uh, worse? Being <laughs> critical? I, I don't have any uh, scientific reasoning behind it, but I've heard at least that women are more critical some men. So that's probably it. I think it's might have something to do with uh, in general way men are considered better gamers than anyway. And it's also very typical of men to be like, oh I'm the best, I'll do this. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's so. kinda of where the Mm. Yeah, see, that would also be one that you could actually test, right? I mean, you could ask people their their abilities, and then you could actually measure how well how well they play the game, or how, what their scores are, or um, how often they win, right? I mean, it, that would have been one that they could have backed up with an analysis of actual performance, rather than just the they say they're worse, but we're not sure we believe. Yeah, exactly. So that that was my comment to the question. I mean, rather than asking what the expansion could be, a more interesting question is how could we figure out what it was. And I think it, I'm not going to suggest that as an uh, as an answer here, but but it's also interesting to see that uh, the dominance of North Americans 
and the fact that they think they do good, there I think there's also a cultural aspect here probably. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Could be, yeah. But definitely, I, I saw an interesting paper um, end of last year, middle of last year, which was talking about. Um, the issues of measuring psychological tests on um, university-aged psychology students, um, because a lot of the psych, psych tests in the standard literature have been conducted on volunteers, which are psych major students who are 19 and 20. Um, and so what you get is you get the standard model of what a 19-year-old psychology major in the US thinks, which isn't necessary the rest of the world. Might be a little bit biased. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that is. Yeah. I mean, the, the the question of why female participants reported that is a different, completely different domain to the gaming um, domain, right? So the the reasons for that could be social or cultural or yeah. But it would be interesting to see a um, measurement of actual performance exactly. uh, compared yeah. to the self-reporting. Exactly. So that, that would be the interesting aspect, whether there is a difference and you know what that difference is. They also mentioned that female performance and performance uh, rate very different based on different emotions. Mm -hmm. yeah. The one I think was what flight and fight and flight response was males were lots higher. Mm -hmm. So why should new trait theory be developed for play games instead of using existing models? Existing ones they're more based on finding out the personality or Logical issues, maybe they're not really uh, tuned into being uh, satisfaction and um, mm -hmm. really. I think that your your own personality when you are out in the world and in a game can be a bit different. Mm -hmm. so, so I would be interested some sort of model that. It's more two and two games. That's just uh, <laughs> this thought, but yeah. the game, I don't know, the game of personality, so it can bring on lots of other traits that you normally don't just play in your everyday life. I, I certainly they, they say this about a lot of sports people is that say they say like on the field. They're um, hard as nails, or they're really competitive, or really focused. And off the field, you know, they're, they're friendly, they're casual, they will help anybody out, and and so they have quite a different persona when they're in the game. Um, um, and so uh, yes, you could you could say that that um, the traits that you ask of people are you asking them when you're in a game, is this what you do? Versus when you're in your life, is this what you do? And do people do they recognize in themselves that there is a change in their behavior? For example, if someone's a, a really kind, caring person, but if they're in a game, they always there are some people that always choose this uh, the, the sadistic <laughs> option, you know, the, you know, they always choose the evil, for example. So, so it's. Yeah. I think to the question, I think there are the two parts. Uh, I think to the question there. One is, uh, I think, is uh, the existing models obviously have weaknesses that make them uh, not so accurate and, and not so useful. Now, the other part of the question is why we should develop a theory, a new theory. That would be because we that knowledge will help us in something. And it's a little bit it's still open what that something is. Mm -hmm. it, it might be to study um, well, uh, the risk of, uh, of uh, getting I mean, to play too much, or, or might be uh, understanding how certain types of, I mean, if you are 
Serious Gaming, we would like to have games for education and games for health, and then they would try to cover as many players as possible. So, so I think that's an interesting part of what would, because if we knew what we would want to use the, the, the theory for, it might be easier to develop a theory. To develop a general theory of players is probably going to be a very big project if you don't know exactly what the theory is going to be for. Yeah. Exactly. And if, you, if you're looking at, at, at behavioral change, I mean, if you're, if you're talking about um, looking at why people speed, it's because you're trying to slow them down on the road, or why people drink and drive. Uh, um, and that's because you want to have a very clear impact on their behavior, uh, and you're trying to find um, how to have change one of the three parts of, of action, um, of sort of yeah, having the behavior. So, um, because when you talk about sort of knowledge or, or a trigger um, and motivation uh, to, to do an action, um, then you've got to kind of work out what are the motivations and what are the triggers and, um, and what are the, the knowledge that people have. Um, but in this case, it, yeah, they, don't, they don't seem to have a very clear stated goal as to, oh, we're going to try and change this one thing about it, um, so let's understand how that links in with why people play games. Mm. All right, and the final question: What are some of the problems with the with using the bubbles test to categorize players? To simplify. Mm -hmm. Is the one issue the fact that you can register that into more than one of those categories, and you yeah. usually the lines are not more clear, and you are not the same. So it's possible. Mm -hmm. The energy of the end of the story. So, so one. So, so there are two problems actually. So one problem is that the categories may be overlapping. But the tests force people to use them as if they were not overlapping, as if they were kind of uh, orthogonal. Uh, so that, first of all, as a tool, may misrepresent of what people are like. And then if you're actually trying to use it, yeah. To if you want to be this category, you can sort of see in the answers what it. It's kind of, it reminds me of those, which character are you in this TV show? And you really see in the answers which you have to choose to become this and this uh, character. Yeah. You can see that about some games as well. For example, Mass Effect. Uh, you need to have a certain amount of either evil or good to unlock new yeah. uh, speech options. And then you can actually, in that game, you can really easily see what it is, what is evil and what is good when he speaks. So you can basically. <laughs> Say okay, good, 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 good through all the game. You don't need to read the dialogue. You can just select the color blue, and it's always good. And you can just autopilot through that and get everything. So, for better or worse. And if someone has really identified with it, I'm going to be the explorer. That's what I am. Even if they are a bit of everything, they will. Maybe they will look at the alternatives and choose what will bring them in, what they see as the right direction. Yeah. There's very different ways of playing games. Um, I, know, I know some people, like when they're playing World of Warcraft, um, some are trying to max out the stats on their, their armor or their weapons, whereas some are having a story about their character. So they'll have a story, oh, my, my, um, my character never uses swords, they only use axes and bows. And so even if they got a sword that was really awesome, they wouldn't use it because that's not within the story of their character. Right? So you can you can play games with, with in very different ways. Um, but yeah, no, the, um, it's it's a it, it's a tricky area to try and decide why people play particular ways, and and mm. people change. Right? It's also the other problem is that I, mean, I certainly I have changed in the way I play games and. What motivates me to play particular games, um, and I change sometimes on a weekly basis. As <laughs> some weeks are higher stress, and other weeks are just have different pressures. And so, 
my motivations change. Yeah. Yeah, my, my, uh, it was interesting. I played some games with my sister, and she always refuses to use power-ups. She says using power-ups is just cheating. <laughs> you have to pass the level without power-ups. <laughs> so I was like, OK. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I think um, we can wrap that one up and have a short break. And then, yeah, we go for the first article after, yeah. Five minutes break. Where is my mouse cursor? 